It's good to hear you visiting and loving on each other a little bit. This is awesome. I don't think you're going to quit visiting, are you? Look at this. All right. Welcome to Cross Point Church. Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. And uh, good to gather together. And, and hey, there's a little coolness in the air. It falls in the air a little bit, isn't it? And uh, but that means football and a few other things. So, uh, and some beautiful colors uh, that are coming our way. I want to welcome everybody that's watching online this morning. We're glad that you're here with us as well. Uh, we're honored you're with us today. Uh, and uh, we believe in prayer around here. There's prayer, car- prayer cards back at the prayer wall there. If you have a prayer request, fill that out. Drop that in that box. We'll pray for you. If it's a little more confidential, there's a connection card box uh, in the lobby at the Welcome Center. You can drop that in there. We're just honored you're here with us this morning uh, and worshiping the Lord together. I'm going to ask you this morning if you prepare your morning tithes and offerings this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving to the Lord. And uh, this is the fourth Sunday. We always talk about missions on the fourth Sunday in la- uh, of the month. Uh, and so um, Holly's going to come and she's going to... Uh, uh, kind of lead us into our missions adventure. We were focusing on Troy and Heidi Darren uh, in Moldova this last month. So Holly, uh, lead us here and where we're going this month here. Good morning, church. Um, I'm hoping you're enjoying this as much as we are on the missions team um, each month, just getting to know um, one of the missionaries that we support as a church a little bit better and praying for the needs that they have. Um, and then also a challenge that we put out there to help us grow in faith and to um, just hopefully be um, a little bit of extra support for our friends and family. Um, so this year, or this year, um, this month, we'll see who we'll be praying for if you want to. mystery it's coming it's coming looks like a lot of words <laughs> the challenge is to share your testimony with someone new and then the prayer is for mark and heather mckinstry and they're in spain planting a church in malaga spain okay mark and heather mckinstry so that's our prayer focus for this month and then also share your testimony. There is no pow- more powerful way, as Pastor Arnie was challenging us, to share what Jesus has done in your life, how he's changed your life with somebody else in a simple story. And uh, that's sharing your testimony. So thank you, missions team. Thank you, Holly. And uh, let's just keep Mark and Heather. Uh, they, we've been supporting them now for a few years uh, in Malaga, Spain. Let's keep them in prayer. Uh, so as we give, to, we give, we're giving part of our missions, our offering this morning, going to missions around the globe. Um, I, I, was, I had a guy cleaning our carpet, uh, the carpets in the church here, and then he was cleaning the carpets in my house. And uh, Chuck said to me, he said, I was, cleaning the car- I was cleaning the carpets at your church, and he says, I saw all those missionaries that you're supporting on the wall. And, uh, uh, and it made a mark on him even as he was in this building. So thank you for your faithfulness and giving to the Lord. Uh, so we bring our tithes, our missions giving, and so thank you. A few announcements while you're doing that. A, a reminder for uh, the Normal Christian Life Bible Study, a small group that's uh, Wednesday night uh, over at Blazeski's home. Uh, and I know, I believe they got to, off to a great start this last uh, week. So those of you who are part of that from 7 to 8 uh, this Wednesday night. Men's Breakfast is this coming um, Saturday from 8 to 9 a.m. I encourage you guys, uh, even if you're a little newer to the church, come hang out with us for that one hour. We'll have a great breakfast together. I think our breakfast is coming from Crystal Coffee uh, this month, and uh, we're going to have a great time together. Uh, Tony Kaler is going to share how God delivered him from alcoholism, and he's going to share his testimony, his story, and uh, that affects a lot of lives. Maybe you have somebody that, that maybe in your family, friend, network, neighbor, that that affects their life. Bring them along, guys, and let them hear how God touched his life and delivered him and changed him uh, in that way. So that's this uh, Saturday morning from 8 to 9 a.m. Um, chapter up reading is Hebrews 6 to 10. Ushers, come forward if you would. I'm going to pray for the offering and then pray for the message this morning, and then we'll get right into God's word. Father, today we thank you for the opportunity to give. Lord, bless gift and giver as we, Lord, pray for Mark and Heather McKinstry in Malaga, Spain. Lord, think of that church that they're establishing, they're planting there in Malaga. Uh, Lord, that uh, 
uh, Lord, I had the privilege of seeing Mark grow up in a youth group and, and uh, see him called to, to missions when he was in Argentina, and, and now that playing out 25 years later in his life, and, and God, pray, pray for him and Heather, and Lord, touch their lives, and, and God, all of us, as we pray for missions, as we see, God, your word advanced around the world, God, I pray that we would just keep that in our hearts and our prayers. God, bless this offering, bless our tithes, our missions giving, uh, Lord, multiply them, and may they meet every need of our congregation in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for the message as we open up your word. I pray to this area that, Lord, your word speaks to and wants to address this area of our, our mental capacity and our thinking and our the, the, the mental health and healing. I pray that your Holy Spirit would go into the places of the heart and mind that I cannot go this morning, and you would drink, just bring help and strength. In your name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you uh, as you give today. Well, if you'll turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 40 this morning, Psalm, uh, Psalm chapter 40, we're in a series called The Healer's Touch, and we, it was kind of keyed off of where Jesus touched the leper, and uh, he uh, reached down and touched the leper. The leper was healed physically, but he had not been touched. He was, there was an emotional element to it because nobody could touch a leper. And he was not just healed physically. Uh, there was a balm in his soul because of the emotional lift uh, in his heart and mind. And so that's the framework of this series. And so then Chad developed that a little bit more from the story of Acts 3 last Sunday morning and the lame man at the gate. And so this morning, I want to, the Holy Spirit prompted me to bring this message called uh, A Biblical Key to Mental Health and Healing. And so we we know because of COVID uh, that this arena is more prevalent than ever before. Um, We see that in some of the sexual dysphoria that is across our globe and in our country, that there's mental health issues that are related to that. And so this area, so I'm not here to give Pastor Jerry's view of this. I'm here to take you to God's Word and let God speak to this area because he will do a lot better than I will uh, regarding this. So um, I'll read the text in just a moment, but let me just begin at this place. Um, It is amazing how much our minds, God's given a capacity for our minds to take. I'm reminded of the story, uh, uh, no greater story than that of uh, of a family in Holland years ago, and they had a clock shop in their home, and uh, it was during the time uh, as World War II was developing and uh, Hitler is moving in to Holland to take over that nation. And he, they had a, a place that they had to hide so that the Gestapo couldn't get to them. And they had a secret closet in the house. Could you imagine living in your own house and have to have a secret closet that nobody could get to? I, I can't imagine. I mean, we think our home is a safe place. We think our home is, is a place that is a respite. But they had to build a closet that was a secret compartment that if the Gestapo was coming, they could all, they had a bell system in the house that everybody could rush to that if if the Gestapo came to the door. The unsuing of that, uh, Hitler came in, they eventually busted into the house, found the family, and uh, the father, uh, they separated the men and women. Uh, They would have some of them, the men and women, lay out in the streets. They would take them and separate men and women. Uh, The father was taken, and Corey and Betsy were taken to a concentration camp at the beginning of uh, the Holocaust. And in that, so she would never see her father again. It's it's presumed that he was killed, murdered uh, by Hitler. Uh, Betsy and Corey were taken to uh, one of the concentration camps, where eventually they were separated and Betsy was burned in one of the ovens there and Corey observed all this. As the, as, uh, the war came in, the American forces came in, the Western forces came in and stopped it, Corey was liberated. She ended up coming to America. Her name is Corey Tinboom. You've maybe heard that name. She went through incredible mental duress. I, to, the, to the proportions that I don't think most of us, I don't know if we could endure. Family separated, death, her sister burned in the concentration camps. I mean, atrocity like we've done. But you know what? As she came out, she trusted her life to Jesus. 
As the years went by, she lived into her 90s, she moved to California, and as the years went by because of the work deep inside her heart and her mind, Jesus healed her heart and mind, and she was a sweet lady up until her death. Have you faced anything that bad? Probably not. The issue is if she can do it, if the Lord can do it in her life, He can do it in your life, in my life, no matter what we face. God has given us an incredible capacity to endure and to persevere. She wrote these words, quote, Jesus Christ is able to untangle all the snarls of my soul. Could you imagine the concentrate? concentration cap, uh, their hair that was matted and they couldn't even comb it. And so in her interpretation of these words, she applied it to her soul. Uh, Imagine a a, a gal whose their hair is ratted out and hasn't been washed for days or cleaned for days. Jesus Christ is able to untangle all the snarls of my soul, to banish all my complexes, to transform even my fixed habit patterns, no matter how deeply they are etched in my sub conscience close quote the psalmist david said it this way look at your text psalm 40 verses 1 to 5 he said it in a little different way to his experience in his life journey and the duress that he was under mentally says psalm 40 verse 1 i waited patiently for the lord and he inclined to me and he heard my cry He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He put a new song in my mouth and praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done. And your thoughts towards us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Those are David's words. Corey said it in her words. Let's study this and let's think about this this morning. I want to first of all deal with some concepts here in these five verses that are enemies to your mental health and healing. I see them within this text. The first one is this. An enemy to, the first enemy to your mental health and healing is impatience. Impatience. Um, impatience with God. Impatience with other people. Impatience with yourself. You ever get impatient with yourself, frustrated with yourself? And the mind starts going because this isn't working or whatever the case might be in your heart and mind. Um, God, I, I want you to fix this. And God, would you do it right now? Right? A microwave God. Press it, press the, put it, and put it in the microwave and hit 30 seconds. God, fix it. And, and God, do it now. And boy, aren't we so demanding of God? Do you know that beautiful pieces of art take a long time to paint? Do you know that beautiful buildings take a long time to build? The psalmist says it this way, as the Lord is building his life, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he heard me and inclined his ear towards me. He says, I waited patiently, but the opposite is this impatience that riddles our heart and mind, and as Americans that we're used to having everything convenient to us, it only gets worse and worse. Another aspect enemy to our mind I see here that can creep into our heart and mind is perpetual negativity. We see the psalmist use these words, a horrible pit. I call it the horrible pit mentality. Uh, it's kind of like, if you've ever seen Winnie the Pooh, my granddaughter, I love to have her sitting in the family room and, and Raymond will get up beside me on the, on the love seat and we'll watch the big TV and I turn Winnie the Pooh on and there's this, there's this guy. I, is, is Eeyore a donkey? Eeyore's a donkey. Eeyore gets up there and he goes, I don't know. I don't know. I think that character they developed there, he, was, he lived in a horrible pit all his life. 
See, this perpetual ne- negativity. And, and the psalmist here says, and it's this mentality, I will never get out. Everything's going to fall apart. Can I tell you what? Satan wants to breathe that in your spirit. All, all, yeah, you, you build your life, you work on your life and all the things that you possess. And, and here's what Satan comes along. He says, it's all going to fall apart. It's all going to fall apart. It's all going to... And he's, he's lying, he's lying, he's lying. It's an enemy to your mind. And he works you over. He works you over is what he does. This perpetual negativity... But what, what, what did the psalmist say? It says, he also brought me up out of the horrible pit. Another enemy of the mind is a, an everything depends on me syndrome. Everything depends on me. An obsession. I've got to do it myself. I've got to pick myself up by the bootstraps and, and I'm going to get through this. I'm grit my teeth. I'm going to do it. I can do it all by myself. Everybody get out of my way. Notice here what the psalmist says. David didn't say, I brought myself up out of a, a, a horrible pit. I brought myself up out of the mire clay. He doesn't say that here. What does he say? He says, he brought me up out of the horrible pit. He brought me up out of the miry clay. David was stuck when he viewed the typography of Israel and he was down in the Jordan Valley, down by the the muck and the mire or in the Jezreel Valley. But everywhere that he looked, he saw rocks and he, he he saw strength and hills and he saw these things. And he brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the muck and the mire, and he gave me a firm place to stand. That's how David saw this as he was writing this. But the... The thing that we've got to avoid in our hearts and our minds, the enemy, is everything depends on me. I've got to do it. He doesn't say that. David says, look what he did. He brought me up. You live with the Lord very long. How many Lord brought you up out of a pit a time or two in your life? Yeah. Uh, the last enemy of our minds is this. It's a lie. I don't matter. I don't matter. Look what David writes here. And he writes these in verse 5. He says, And your thoughts towards us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. In other words, the psalmist is saying of the Lord, God, your thoughts towards us They are more than even can be numbered. What is he saying? He's saying, you matter to God. What's going on in your heart and mind? What's troubling you? What's rattling you? He's he's, he's saying, God's thoughts towards you are more than you can even number. Is that not amazing? That's what he says. Now, Let's shape how David for a moment is writing these words and thinking about this. The Psalms themselves are a book of 150 Psalms and they are a book for mental health and healing. Let me give you the context for a moment for the Psalms themselves to refresh your memory. You might know this. But do you remember David? He had an incredible victory. He took, and Pastor Ernie, you probably preached on this many times, and, and remember David when he was a young, a young lad, and he picks up the five smooth stones, and he goes out, and he puts them in the thing, and he takes out Goliath with one stone in his slingshot, and he is down. At that point, in the next chapter, chapter 17, the Lord anoints him king of Israel. But from that, his life didn't go so well for the next 10 years. He's, the, he's anointed king, but he ends up being chased by Saul for the next 10 years. And at sometimes he's homeless. He's, being, he's living almost a paranoid... Well, Saul is paranoid. And David is running for his life for the next 10 years. You ever wish your problems would go away? I think David wished they would. But in God's character development program that he put David through, He allowed David to write the Psalms to help you and me. And all that period of time that David went through, that's where the Psalms came out of. 
The Psalms are actually the old hymn book that was used for years. And they're, they're words of help and healing and mental strength that David had to experience as he trusted God and where he wrote this psalm, these five verses from. And God used these tremendously. I was, I was uh, talking to one of the executives over at one of the universities here in town. And, and he said to me, he said, when students come to our university, he said, we are going to stretch their mind more than they have ever dream possible. Well, if I were to think about God, God has some form of character development program, doesn't he? He stretches our heart and mind at times more than we believe that we even have the capacity to do and to get through. But in his wisdom, he knows that we will. And, and after he does, it's amazing that even in this experience of David, uh, he writes these words. It says, um, he put a new song in my mouth, a praise to our God. And as David wrote these songs that we sing that bring us comfort, and Pastor Chris and the worship team so beautifully led us, Psalms was the PowerPoint presentation, the hymn book of years past to bring strength to our mental thinking and, and, he, and bring healing to our soul. But David says this, many will see it in fear and trust in the Lord. And I don't know about you, but as you've, you've read the things that he went through in his heart and his mind, as what he went through, how many of you have said, I can turn my heart and my life to trust the Lord in a beautiful way because of what he went through. When God brings you through stuff, when God brought Corey Tin Broom through stuff, you know what it does? It allows others to trust in the Lord and, 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 and to trust the Lord. Uh, when uh, you go through things and maybe you've got a neighbor, friend, a relative, or, or maybe you're going through something and I, I've been through that and you share your victory of how the Lord brought you out of that and it encourages you and, and we feed off each other when we see God's goodness working in our life as God's writing the Psalms in your life. Everybody say amen. That's what he's doing. But this book is a book, these 150 psalms, are psalms for mental health and healing. You're, you're going through some struggle, you're going through some difficulty, I encourage you, just camp out in the psalms. Just, just hang out there. Just read. Uh, don't even read a whole chapter. Read a portion. Just hang in it. And you'll find the Lord touching your life as we're going to experience this morning in these few verses. So I, a couple questions this morning. Do you believe that God is going to take care of you? Do you trust God? Here's some yeses. Let me talk about the weakness of independence. The weakness of independence. When we raised kids in home, we were all kids at one time. America, we raise our kids up. We have one goal, right? To make them what? independent is that a right goal so that that's our goal Stephen Covey wrote his world-class writing called seven habits of highly effective people maybe some of you have read and uh, in it he said there's a higher higher level of maturity than independence and he called it interdependence where we move from being independent that in a workplace environment that you can learn to work with coworkers and, and you find yourself, you're interdependent. A family, kids, you're all, you find yourself interdependent on each other and that's a higher level of maturity. Can I press that one more level this morning and, and say that God wants to birth another aspect in our life and that's where we lift that maturity another, another level to the aspect of trust. Let me give you an example of that. You take a, su a successful business. Uh, you, you, you can have a, a business person or whatnot. They can do a business and they can do a certain amount by themselves until they wear themselves out and, and or they can just, they'll keep it small. But if, if a, a business person or an employer, they will, they will employ and they will trust other people with the task back away and watch them doing those tasks and trust the others, guess what? That company grows and it grows and gets stronger and stronger because a lot of people are trusted. See, can I tell you the weakness of independence? It's, it's kind of a wrong goal that we have as Americans. I'm going to raise my kid up to be independent, not to listen to anybody to do their own thing. Well, that's not a great goal. Interdependence is a higher level of maturity, but trust 
is even a greater aspect of maturity I want to suggest to you as we think of this. So, now I, as, I, as I get to this biblical key of mental health and healing, I want to just tell you right from the outset it's going to bother some of you. I'll tell you why. The word I'm going to give to you, it's an elusive word. Here's what we want. Pastor, give me three quick steps in three minutes so that I can have mental health and healing. I want concrete steps, right? Give me concrete steps. I could do that. It wouldn't be biblical, and it wouldn't be from God. The biblical key is an elusive word, but it's so real, and it's so true. Because it's God's idea, not my idea. New Testament, I I could use the word faith. I could use the word believe. But here's the word the Holy Spirit wants us to camp on this morning. Sometimes in our Christian walk, the Holy Spirit has to use a word that maybe means something else, but he wants to rivet for a moment in time to rivet a fresh revelation into our heart and life to get us to the next place he wants to get us. Everyone understand that? And this morning might be, it's something that you've heard before, but it's a fresh word that will help hold you and strengthen you at this place in time for your heart and mind, but it's very true. And I want to go back to the Old Testament word, the formation of this word that I want to talk about this morning. It's the word trust. Trust. Yesterday, I did a lot of driving. I was in central Minnesota when I woke up yesterday morning, and we were at Sue's sister's house in Buffalo, Minnesota, and I had to drive into northern Wisconsin. I, I didn't know how far north I was going to go. I thought I was just going over the border into Wisconsin. I, I ended up, I, I put on the GPS, and I ended up 60 miles south of Superior. I had to do a 25th wedding anniversary and share some words, and then had a four hour, I had to punch my GPS when I got there to see how long of a drive I had. I had a four-hour drive back home last night. I had an assignment this morning I had to get home to. But I, I, I was driving out of Minneapolis, and I didn't know where I was going in northwestern Wisconsin somewhere. Little town, Webster, going to a church there. And um, these GPSs are quite amazing. And so I'm going up Highway 35 North out of the Twin Cities and, and going up uh, towards Duluth. And I, at some point, there was, gave, gave me three options. I recognized the first one. I've been on that road before. Eight. Uh, the next one, I recognized Highway 95 that would get me over into Wisconsin. The third one, I didn't recognize whatsoever. But it was, it was 11 minutes faster, and I needed to go fast. I picked that fastest route, and guess what I had to do going up 35 North? It was going to lead me up to a road in a way I had never been before. I had to trust that little sucker app. Holy tamole. I followed that baby. I'm, I'm, I, I said, Sue, I'm going north. I keep going north. What is going on? I, and then, then I started to doubt. Did I punch the address in right? Ever been there? I go across into Wisconsin, Grantsburg, Wisconsin, somewhere. I turn north again. I, I said, Sue, I, I was so far in the Tuileries yesterday, the bars were all boarded up. There was no bars left open. It was crazy. And we get up to this little town of 697 in this church, and it was packed with people, and I was able to share some encouragement of this couple I'd married 25 years ago. And uh, they celebrated beautifully their 25th anniversary. But this whole idea of trust. We live in this arena of trust. You can't now, right now, see the air you're breathing and the oxygen. You're breathing oxygen. You just can't see it. We live in an arena of trust. So, let me just give you a biblical history for a moment before I wrap it up. And my, my points will move quickly at the end. Biblical history of trust. God says that we are children of God. Psalm 22, 9 and 10, David says these words. He says this, But you are he who took me out of the womb. He's attributing God's the one that took me out of the womb. You Now listen to this. God, you made me trust on my mother's breast. 
I was cast upon you from birth, my mother's womb. You have been my God. God, the history of biblical trust, it's from our mother's womb. Nursing in our mother. That's where God formed trust in our life. I didn't make those words up. God made them. God says those. Can I tell you what? The sun in biblical history, how many of you are glad that the sun comes up every day? Well, we don't see some of it sometimes, but it comes up, right? There's light. Sun comes up every day. There's light, the faithfulness of God. Psalm 22, 4 and 5. Our fathers trusted you. They trusted you and you delivered them. They cried out to you and they were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. God allows us to get in the position of a kid as an adult until we cry out to God for help. And we trust him and he eases our minds is what it says there in verse 5. Has anyone in this room been without water or food this last year? Has God taken care of you? God is faithful to take care of us. So let me, I want to go to three observations this morning regarding trust that can heal your mind. And they're actually going to go quite quickly. But um, three observations regarding trust that can heal your mind. You say, say, Pastor, how can something that's so elusive heal our mind? I'm going to show you in Scripture. Let me give a clarification before I get into these. Trusting God does not dismiss your responsibilities. You say, well, pastor, I don't need to go to work tomorrow because God's just going to take care of me. I'm just going to trust him. No, that's against another principle of God's word. The Bible also says you don't work, you don't eat. So you understand, take this in context. So what we've got to do is we've got to know, we got to do the best we know to do. We've got to make the decisions that we know best to make. And then all of a sudden we all come to these places where God, I don't, I've done all I can do. I don't know what to do <coughs> anymore. Say, God, at this point, I have to turn it over to you. And then, God, I've got to trust you. But, so I want you to understand that it does not eliminate your responsibilities as we talk about this. Clarification. Number one, trusting God gives you peace. Trusting God gives you peace. What happens when we're not at peace? Our mind is racing. Our mind is rattled. Our mind's obsessing about this fear or that worry or what could happen. What if? Our mind is... At, and and the, the heart cry when we're struggling in our mind is we are, that hunger is I want peace. God, I just need peace. That's the heart cry. Look at these words. So trusting God gives you peace peace. You say, Pastor, how? Look at this. Here, let's go back to the Old Testament. New International Version, Isaiah 26, 3. Look at this. It says, this, this one, you need to take this verse. I'll tell you what you need to do with this verse. You need to take this, and you need to take this verse, write it down, and you need to put it and lock it in your safety deposit box. It's that good. Look at what God's Word says here. It says, you will keep him in perfect peace, whose minds, a little typo, are steadfast, whose minds are steadfast, whose minds are stuck, whose minds are fixed, whose minds are firm, what? Because they what? They trust in you. Where does peace come from? It comes from trusting the Lord. It comes from trusting the Lord. That seems so hard to understand. That seems so hard to comprehend. Uh, My mind is going to be fixed. My mind is going to be firm. My mind's going to be stable. My mind's going to be sturdy. Why? Because I'm going to trust in the Lord. Romans 15, 13. Let's go to the New Testament. Look at this. May the God of all hope Fill you with all joy and what? Peace. As you what? Trust in him. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to come and he wants to breathe peace in you. But the, 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 the avenue comes through trusting the Lord. He's going to take care of you. One more verse, John 14, 27. Peace I live, leave with you, my peace I give to you. In other words, he's coming, Jesus says, I'm going to come and I'm going to transport, my, when you trust him, he's going to put his peace in your heart and life. Isn't that awesome? What a deal. How many of you want Jesus' peace in your mind? That's what we need. Is Jesus, you don't need pastor's peace, church. You need Jesus' peace in your heart and mind. 
That's what you need. And so that's what he says here. My peace, don't let your hearts be troubled, it goes on to say. Number two, trusting God gives you joy. When you trust God, you have joy because he's taking care of your concerns. So you, you, how many of you love being with little kids? You like being with little kids? Watch them go racing. Man, you just wait till after church a few minutes. Some of you are going to be quick, done quick, okay? You'll, you'll see some kids come up from upstairs. And they'll be racing around in here, running around in the lobby, and maybe they're annoying some of you. Good for you. You need to lighten up and live, okay? And, um, but those kids, why can they be laughing and full of joy? Because they know that dad and mom are taking care of everything. That's how come they can bounce around. That's how come they can have a, a laughter in their soul. Because they know that dad and mom are paying rent tomorrow or this week, whatever the case might be. Monday, Friday, whatever the first is. God, they're going to go get the groceries. They're going to go take us out to eat. And so a kid can just, because they trust dad and mom that they're taking care of stuff, joy comes on to a kid's heart and mind and they're free. So what is this? Let's go back to this verse. Romans 15, 30. Not only is there peace, he says, God, may the God of hope fill you with what? All joy. Not just a little trickle of joy. All joy and peace as you trust him. Trust in the Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit and it will give you that peace. There's an old hymn. Maybe you remember this. Some of you that have been around for the block for a while and been around Christianity. It's, it's this song And it says it this way, not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sigh or a tear can abide while we trust and obey. Oh, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be what? Happy in Jesus, but then to trust and obey. You, th- you see some kid running around. He's, the happiest time in a kid's life is when they're trusting and obeying their parents. Dad and mom are taking care of everything, and they're walking in obedience. And I'll tell you what, there's just joy around that kid. Now, if they get in trouble, they start disobeying. It's a different story, okay? But it's both go hand in hand. So the psalm say, it says here in verse 4, I want you to, and here is our, our key verse here. If you want to underline these two phrases in your Bible. And I got them up here on the screen. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Blessed is the one. So David in these five verses with all of those caveats, all of those enemies that he marks, his summation of these, these, this concept here, this idea is he says, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. What does that word bless there mean? Well, we know from the New Testament what it means. It means the same in the New Testament as the Old. This, uh, the Good News translation, I like the way it says it here. Happy are those who trust in the Lord. The, um, uh, one of the other translations says it this way. The New Living Translation says, Oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord. You know, if you can walk out these doors today, you, you can just say, man, you know what? I got some problems in life, and I got some stuff going on. I got some, some junk that I'm dealing with. My kids, my finances, my whatever. I got some stuff going on. But you know what? You bounce out of here because you know what? I got a Heavenly Father up there that he's taking care of a few of these concerns of mine, and I can walk out with joy this morning because he's there taking care of. So, oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord. This truth gives mental healing and help in our minds as we think. Last in this, trusting God gives you confidence. Ah, and let me give you just for a moment a mistaken trust or a diverted trust. Uh, we have so much money, abilities, strength, power, uh, we have so many tools at our disposal as Americans. And here's the, the f- fallacy, is that we can begin to trust in ourselves. Have the wrong sense of self-confidence. Confidence God puts in us, but we can have it where we're only leaning on ourselves, right? 
And so, it, it, Psalm, the psalmist writes in Psalm 20, verse 7, he says this, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Even back in this time, when there was battles, they were, they, they, oh, who's got the biggest army and the biggest chariots and the most chariots? And, and they were looking at strength and power. David says, no. He says, confidence comes from remembering the name of the Lord. How many times the battles, the, the odds were all the way against them in some battle. And the Lord won because the Lord was on their side. It says in verse 4 of our text, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor turn aside to lies. There's so much of our, our human pride that can get mixed into this. And so anyway... So I'm, I'm just saying the mistake in diverted trust is to just trust in ourselves. That's, that's the wrong place. But trusting God gives us confidence. Let me wrap this up this way. So this, this idea, I, I, I don't even put that slide up there, Ashley. Don't put the next slide up because I, I have it wrong in my notes, I realize. This definition of trust is this. And... Uh, uh, here in the scripture in verse 4 it says blessed is the man who makes the lord his trust now 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 just listen to this for a moment you, you know when we get into uh our, our mind starts to worry and we use this word but this could happen but that could happen we, we always say we say well this part is going good but ever been there are you am i am i preaching to the people today i mean is okay but this could go wrong. But you know what could happen if this happens. But this. Can we go back to that slide, uh, Ashley? Blessed is the, the one who trusts the Lord. Go back to that, that slide of that scripture. That word trust there in the Hebrew, in this patch of scripture, here is the spelling of it literally. It's B-T-H. And it, it's pronounced butta. Butta. And that word means trust Blessed is the one who has confidence and sure in the Lord. So when, when worry begins to creep into your mind, obsession of something that could go wrong, or everything's going to fall apart, and these lies that come into your heart and mind, and you're ready to say, but, here's, I want to encourage you to transfer it to this. Instead of saying, but, say, well, but, uh, the Lord is going to take care of this. My confidence and surety is, is in He is on my side. He is going to... Blessed is the one. But ah! He is taking care of it. Ah! Not that, but but ah! I literally, I, I'm not making this up. I'm just preaching to you the Bible. That's what the David said after God picks him up out of this horrible pit and he puts a song in his mouth and he says, blessed is the one and joyous is the one who has confidence and assurity that God is going to take care of me. No matter what's troubling my heart and my mind. So trusting in God gives you peace. Trusting in God gives you joy. And trusting in God gives you confidence. I, I, I want to just end with one story. Uh, Hannah's going to come, worship team, whoever's going to come and do this. I, I called Hannah on Tuesday because I heard a song last week. And um, uh, and, and I'll tell you the story in a second. Uh, th- there's a scripture that... Uh, that is, my, my mother-in-law, it was, I think it's on her gravestone. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. The smartest man in the world wrote the Proverbs. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Many of you know where I'm going to go right now. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, what? Acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. He said, Pastor, I don't know what's next in my life. I don't know this or that. I don't know what's going to happen with my kids. I don't know. I, it says here, 
If you will trust the Lord, lean not on your own standing. What it says, He will direct your paths. He will direct your paths. He will direct your paths. When I was driving that stupid GPS yesterday, I had to trust it because those things are nuts. I was on that Waze app. I'm driving. It says, there's a car broken down on the side of the road two miles up, or 2.2 miles up the road. I get up there, sure enough. I said, Sue, how does this stupid thing know what's broken down up there 2.2 miles away? But then I thought about that. Think about, you think, God, how how can you keep track of all of us? That little little GPS is a little signal. And could you imagine if, if I just did a little experiment here? I just sent you guys all out this morning, right after church. Okay, I'm going to give you an address. I want you to go. And then, but I say, on your way there, would you all go different directions? Go just mess up your GPS. What's it going to go? Rerouting, 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 rerouting. And eventually we'd all get there. How many of you know as we trust God? He can reroute us when we get going the wrong direction. If we trust Him, He says, I will direct your paths in the direction you're going. And life gets messy. So I heard this song in the story last week. I was at the Cup of Joy with my parents. And a, a gal by the name of Sonia, I don't know her ma- her married name is, she writes this words to this song. And she was telling the story about how she, she, she was married late in life in her mid-30s. And so having kids was a concern. And so she got pregnant and she had a miscarriage. So she went to the hospital, dealt with that, and then she went back a second time, and she, or she, she, went, she got pregnant a second time, and then a few months into it, she starts to hemorrhage. Of course, tears started to come down. She was in misery and, and difficulty. The emotional, mental toll on her was just heartbreaking. She's at the house getting cleaned up, ready to go to the hospital again, because what she foresees in her heart and mind is that she's going to have another miscarriage, because she's got it all forecasted in her heart and mind. At that point, before she ever got to the hospital, the Lord dropped the words to this song. She was a singer-songwriter into her heart and mind, and these are the words that Hannah's going to sing it in a moment. Hannah, it's kind of in your style. That's why I asked you to do this, okay? <clears throat> it's called, the song is called Peace in Trusting. God only knows how I've cried, heartbroken and my hands are tied. But he's been faithful time and time again. And although I don't know how it ends, there's peace in trusting the Lord. Now listen to this. Peace when my faith and fear are at war. So I don't have to worry. He knows what's in store. And there's peace in trusting God the Lord. There's peace in trusting the Lord. Let's listen to these, this chorus and uh, verse and chorus as Hannah sings it. God only knows how I've cried i But he's been faithful time and time again. And although I don't know how it ends, there's peace and trust in the Lord. stand together I don't know if you can pick up that last chorus uh, and sing it with Hannah there's peace in trusting the Lord Oh. 
Father, this morning, Lord, I pray as we as your people are together, Lord, I pray that you would allow us to trust you more and more. And Lord, we'd recognize this morning that you want to place a deep peace in our heart and life as we trust you. You want to bring joy into our heart and life as we trust you. You want to give us a godly confidence and surety, Lord, as we trust you that you're taking care of us as your children. God, I just thank you, God, for the work that you're doing in hearts and lives this morning, those that are watching online. And we give you the praise and we give you the glory. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Well, if you need prayer for any reason, come around here. Somebody will pray with you. Otherwise, Lord bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.